Okay, friends, welcome to the session on risk management and compliance. Now, this subject when I talk around is certainly the risk is all around us. And particularly when we deal with procurement, contracting, supply chain, risk is bound to be there. But the question is how far we can mitigate it. Sometimes risk is good also, particularly when you're changing a supplier. There's a risk that when you're trying to change the supplier, supplier may become worse than the previous one, but still the guy may come with a better product, better lead time. So there's a possibility that risk could also be a good thing. So with this in background in mind, let me see what we plan to cover up. So what we are trying to do in the learning objective today is a risk in the context of supply management. So I'm not sticking per se only purchasing. I'm trying to talk about the supply as a whole. That means in the supply chain as well, logistics, warehouse, in the whole supply chain, what type of risks are there around? Steps involved in the risk management process. So when we say understand the risk now, what are the process around? How do I mitigate my risk around? Or should I ignore the risk around? and still jump into this. Implication of various risk factors. Obviously, each risk has some implications around. Understand the risk management strategies. So the risk management strategies, the different strategies around, we'll talk about those. Role of supply manager in assessing the risk. So you're trying to identify the risk, you're trying to assess them, and then based on the assessment, you do the management part, guys, okay, this risk is very heavy to me. This risk could stop my production. This risk could put me in trouble around in terms of my career around. So let me really plan or at least communicate to the bosses around, guys, this could lead to this risk around. Then next question come all the time when the risk is there. We, some risk we are comes up, even if you're following the process, still risk comes up but still there are processes, the guidelines for each organization, particularly when you're spending money, we have to be complying with that. The procedure wise, we have to comply with that. In case we want to go out of the procedures, we need to get clearances for that around. So each organization, if I talk around, they have their own internal control framework and the internal control framework, they talk about the procurement guidebook, standard operating procedures, they talk about the legal side, what documentation has to be used around, what terms and condition has to be used around. So in short, you also have a control framework. So the risk and the control framework goes together. So the objective, the way we look around for today's session is learn to identify and manage potential risks and ensure compliance with the guidelines. So that is the bottom line, what I feel we need to cover up. Let's start with the definition of risk. As I said to you in the beginning, risk is all around us. Now, question is risk is, it can have, anything can happen in the future. Beginning. It can also revolve around your mind, opinion. That means you're trying to take some actions. It can also have certainty, uncertainty of the choice in things around. So you have made some choice around that has got some uncertainty. So possibly there's a risk in that. So risk, if I look from the potential problem, it might happen, it might not happen. So there is uncertainty sometime. The risk may or may not happen. And then there are other ones, there's a risk can also be linked with the loss. Sometimes we link risk with the, I'm having something, I lost something. I'd say there's a risk in this. I'm getting some value in something, I lose it. Again, there's a risk around. But sometimes by taking a risk, particularly when I said to you, I change the supplier, I get a supplier whose lead time is much better than the previous one. So that risk has helped me to gain something. So risk is not bad all the time when I look from the procurement perspective. Now let's look at the risk in the supply chain as a whole. Now in the risk, when we say around, there's a likelihood of everything. Likelihood could be 60%, likelihood could be 90%, likelihood could be 100%, a likelihood could be only 10%. But the impact could be different. So sometimes the likelihood of earthquake is maybe 10%, but the impact could be much bigger. But then there are other issues around where the likelihood is 
very much there, but impact may be very small for me. So there's a possibility of various combinations, and that's what we will try to review around. Now, if you look at the supply chain disruption, any event that negatively impacts my whole supply chain, suppose my supply chain is going and one part has not come, and my supply chain come to disruption, totally stops around. So that means one delay or one parts being not fit for use, quality is very poor, it could disrupt my whole supply chain. So that risk is there. The risk could be of quality. The risk could be of delay. The next could be the discrete event happens around. There's a machine breakdown. If I'm in the production shop, it's a critical machine. Certainly that machine is down. My whole production line could come to a standstill until I outsource somewhere else. There could be a fire. There could be a strike. There could be product failure. Now, externally also could be earthquake and tsunamis and all those things as well. Now, continuous events, if I talk around is internally, performance metrics, warranty trends, I look around, external, demand shift, economic factors. And those events could also be there linked with my currency fluctuation all the time. So there could be a wide range of continuous events as well. Let's look at this bigger picture now here. In the supply chain, if I look from the perspective, your organization is in the center. So one side you're facing the supplier's environment, other side is my customer environment. Now, so it is not my organization alone I have to look around my risk. The risk of my suppliers are my risk. If my supplier is based in some other country, let's say Mexico, and they get a flood, my supply will stop or my supplier is in Thailand and my parts are not coming because they are having a flood around. So that could make a big difference around. Similarly, on the customer side, customer says, guys, send us so many pieces around. And customer is not, a customer becomes bankrupt, customer has got some other issues around, the guy is not able to receive the good items from you. So those type of environments, if you look at it, one is internal facing, which is again within your own organizations, but something could also be faced by the supplier and something faced by the customer. So all put together gives you a bigger picture of, bigger perspective, holistic picture of supply chain. So here I just tried to clarify, as you can see, with the supplier it could be relationship risk. My relationship has become bad because payment was not made. Supplier performance risk, supplier performance is poor. Human resource risk, the guy who was the critical guy with the supplier has left them. Then supply chain disruption risk, supplier environmental risk, disaster risk, political risk, the countries I mean going through the turmoil, the financial risk, regulatory risk. Now those suppliers may be sitting abroad or maybe sitting in one another state, those could also affect your chain as well. So their risk becomes your risk as well until you take some action on it. Your risks are basically operational risk. Your guidelines are not good. Your procedures are not good. Financial controls are not correct. So there could be operational risk around. Then you could also have technical risk. The specification which was made, you got the item made, but the item is not working well. Financial risk, legal risk, now, legal guidelines are there around, but you guys have not followed them. Or the legal guidelines may not be comprehensive enough. And when you do it, there's a risk on liability clause and which was not covered in the legal part. Environmental risk, whatever you do, you might be damaging the environment. So that part, again, government could say, guys, you can't do anything until you sort it out. So HR issues, health issues, safety risk, political risk, country risk. Similarly, on the customer side, they also have financial risk, the distribution risk, relationship risk. Your relationship with customers have gone bad. The market has become very bad. The customer is buying from you, but the market is risk, not good. So we, we drop the idea, say, guys, okay, I'll buy later. 
the brand risk, reputation risk, product liability risk, environmental risk. So all this bundle up risks can affect your things. So if I go a little further on this, the types of risk, I'm trying to go into more deep of the risk so that whenever we think of any procurement or supply chain activities around, we really need to look around these parameters as well. The regulatory part, the government may have restrictions sometime on government carbon emissions, environmental issues I told to you, work health, property and equipment, if natural disaster happens around, security issues of theft, fraud, all those things, economic, financial, staffing, suppliers such as issues with the, within the business resulting in failure, interruptions. So coming back to another type, there's a direct risk and there's an indirect risk. So the one which is coming from supplier, which is passed on the risk from supplier to you, is indirect risk. So, or even the suppose the nature has got something which is indirect risk. It's not that you have created it. Suddenly the flood comes around. It is not yours, a natural disaster. So those are also indirect risks as well. Now managing the risk in your business, that's what I would put on this. Now, first thing when we talk of managing is to identify, identify the risk. That's a very key thing now. So whenever you're placing an order, you know the supplier is reliable, not reliable. Have you kept sufficient buffer time on the lead time? Are the quality is good or not? So all those parameters you have to think of. So that means first is identifying the risk. That's a key part, there's a prime thing around. Then I have to assess the risk. Risk is there, I told you in the beginning. Risk is all around us, fine. But then I have to assess it. Is it too big? Is it too small? What is the impact of it? Risk is small, impact is less. Even worse thing happen, I can always buy, no problem. I can still insure it. And developing the strategy to manage risk is known as risk management. So the whole strategy part. See, if I have to summarize this, identifying risk, assessing risk, and then developing the strategy to manage the risk is called risk management. So risk management is covering these broad parameters. Around. So supply chain risk, if I look around, I will try to give you some examples so to basically emphasize and why this is very important. Now, the entire Japanese vehicle industry is grounded to a halt following the earthquake that stopped production piston rings. Now, the piston rings were coming from a company called Riken. So just because of one company, the whole plant was stopped. Toyota in particular were forced to stop operation at all the 12 domestic plants. So you can imagine around this small thing can make a big difference. So as a chief of procurement, as a chief of supply chain, are you looking into this? I'm, I'm, I'll again try to emphasize one more example. If I know very well, one of the auto companies here, they were getting the gearboxes from Thailand. And Thailand in 2011 went into the floods and the gearbox was not coming. So the whole plant was shut down for three months. You can imagine the loss which happens with that. So you have to be very careful on the risk management. That's what I would try to emphasize, the need for risk management. Another example is here also. Here is a different story around the fire happened in the semiconductor factory of Philips. It's called the worldwide shortage of radio frequencies chips. There's a Nokia and Ericsson, they were the biggest buyer those days. Now, some were saying, okay, guys, let it come up and then we'll start the plant. And they told the customer, guys, sorry, guys, we'll not deliver you for an extra month. Now, the approach taken by Nokia was different, Ericsson was different. Nokia immediately lined up another source and redesigned the chips so that they could be produced elsewhere. However, Ericsson responded more slowly and lost an estimated so much. And this one shows you some figures around, based on the dates around. So Nokia's and Ericsson, so Nokia went down, they changed this one, the design, got the chip made from someone else. While Ericsson was sticking with one supplier saying, oh, guys, oh, nobody else can make it. It's a monopoly supplier. It's one supplier. But if you change the design, possibly somebody can help you. 
So they were waiting, waiting, and they lost much more and lost the business as well. So the total loss, if you can see the last line was $1.7 billion loss. Plus your loyalty of the customer also you lost. And this I'm sure those of you who are in this business of procurement must be seeing it. And particularly when you're doing a global outsourcing. So that's the way it happened around. Hyundai Motor India's example, again, I can talk around major fire in 2004. Supplier was Polyflex, disrupt the whole seed supply chain for Hyundai Motor India Limited. No supply for three to four days in Chennai plant. So ultimately they had to airlift from South Korea, but airlifting means um, whatever the backlog has to be covered, you have to buy something extra, it costs you fortune. So one has to keep in mind in your list, particularly those who are being a single source monopoly suppliers, you have to keep in mind the potential risk in those business. If you're not managing your risk, turn the things are going well, people will pat you, they'll say, oh, you're doing a great job. But the day this dis happen, disruption happens, somebody's job could be in difficulty. So my request to you will be as a head of the procurement, you have to be very careful of this. Another reputation impacts if I talk around is whenever there's a delay, whenever this happens, it could be the part shortages around, it could be the customer changes around, it could be production problems around, development problems around, quality problems, all are leading it to, you can see the average stakeholder returns goes down. If the market knows that their quality is not good, too many returns are going back the stock market also goes down. So you can imagine the reputation of your company is also there. So sometimes I know we try to find a supplier at the lower cost, but that cutting the corner could affect your quality and could damage much more than what you were saving in the price per se. Now the broadly what I would say based on the CPSM syllabus, the risk management process is comprising of eight steps. And the, most of them talk about four steps, but they have been against basically they condense many of the activities around. So this gives you broad ideas around. The very first thing is identify risk. Check the probability of occurring. Is what is the probability of this risk around? Likelihood impact also. So probability is one thing. Probability may be under person, no problem. But the impact is zero. I don't care that. So the impact is very important to me. Then we develop the profile, guys, okay? For each and every activity around your buying, particularly where you've got a single source supplier, you develop the risk profile. And sometimes you also have a risk appetite also. Okay, one day it doesn't happen, I can afford to wait. If I'm in a service industry, I say, guys, okay, one or two days delay, no issues around. I'm working with a banking company, furniture get delayed for it, three days, four days, chair get delayed, not a big issue around. So my risk profile is there, my risk appetite is there, that's what I do. Develop the risk management strategies, allocate the resources. Obviously, if I want to zero down the risk, I have to put more resources. But do my company allows me to put more resources? They will allow me to have more inventories? There's a trade-off. The moment I keep more resources around, keep more inventory, my money is blocked there then execute the strategies and review the results, guys. At the end of the day, you say, guys, whatever action we were taking, what decision we were doing, does it make sense to me or not, or to the company? So that's what the whole story is. Now, coming back to the process, as I said to you, same eight steps I've explained here and on, I can, but keep this in mind, the last line I've kept around is, the risks are an ever moving target. So today you might have planned a risk under the existing environment, Tomorrow, your environment changes, the political environment changes, the, from where you're buying, there the political environment changes or something, business environment changes, the target, the whole risk factor could change. So that's what I'm calling the risk are ever moving target. So you have to review it on a regular basis. If you feel you did the risk studies around the season were done, at the end, you're not very happy so next time again, you have to review it back. The new, new decision has to be done. So if I look from the supply chain in a very simple form, the risks are there on the supply risk, on the supply side. 
the processes where I'm doing in the particular in the production plant and the demand goes up. Customer tells me I want this. And then you find, oh, there you don't have a stock around. We have to get the material. We have to get this. And by the time you make it, the customer goes to someone else and buys from somewhere else. So there's a big risk around. So this is why today's world, we are focusing a lot on balancing the supply and demand. If I go to two, three decades back, this risk was very negligible. First thing, the competition was not there. And the customer was not so much connected, I would say. Customer was, today we all are connected very well. We want, today we place an order, we want same day. So we can't have patience to wait for it. So choice is there. You, those of you who have been in India, they know very well the Bajaj scooters, you have to wait for four years, five years. Choice was not there. But today there are choices available around. And since we have a choice around, people don't want to wait. And if your forecast is bad, you may lose a customer. So supply risk, demand risk, and then the network control risk. Control risk is how well the system connected around. And this is the way I find most of the companies, wherever I have seen around in the manufacturing side in India, they're still working in silos. Supply chain is still sequential. Supply chain is not connected together. Since supply chain is not connected, those of you who understand the tower system, the information doesn't go to all. It goes from one line to another line, another to another one. So in the process, by the time you deliver it, you are lost again. So those five risks, again, are clarified here. So the demand risk, the process risk, supply risk, network risk, and environmental risk. So those certainly you have to look around. Particularly when I'm, suppose if I'm based in Japan, environment is one of the major issues. Tsunami is very common. So one has to look into this. Now we did some survey on this around, so we found the risk which I could attribute to different parameters. The very first one comes supplier failure. I think in most of us, because still we are working within the country around import is there, I'm not saying that, but the supplier failure is a major, major issue. Strategic risk, the natural disasters in some places I've seen in Chennai when items were coming from the Dell computers, parts were coming. I was based in Malaysia, the items were coming and there was a flood, so they could not receive the goods around. So those risks were there around. Geopolitical events, regulatory risk around, government changes the guidelines. So those risks come around. Logistics failure. Transportation has gone on a strike. Intellectual property infringements. There are very few, but there could be five. So this is the broadly what we could see around in the Indian context around what could be the possible risk factors which are very popular. Now, when we coming back to the next step of checking the probability part, so probability mean I'm trying to score it. Score mean I'm saying, oh, very high. So that means when I say very high, so what I say very high and my colleague says very high, the meaning could be different. So this is where to define it. I'm sure most of you who are doing the risk management in your organization, there must be clear definition of each one. Otherwise I've got 40 supply procurement offices one guy is calling very high in a different terminology. Otherwise, understand very high in their own. It's a subjective matter. So to avoid the subjectivity around most of the companies, we try to advise them, guys, you must have your own indicators. So when I say very high, it means encountered very regularly, maybe daily, weekly, monthly. High and irregular occurrence. So then we try to also give a score on that around. So technically, we try to define each and every term, what is very high, very, very high, medium, low, and very low. So my request to all of you would be at, back at the end of your company, when you look back at your home in your company, whether do they have indicators or not. Similarly, when I looked on the likelihood, the probability is the likelihood. The other side, I'm looking at the impact also. So when I'm looking at the likelihood is very high, the impact could be what? effect on service, 
effect on project, reputation, and financial impact. So depending on this, you have to see the which in the matrix around very high effect on, let's say, financial impact. So when I define this financial impact, my cost in excess of 75%. Then if something I had planned for $10,000 is costing me 75% more now. So that's my financial impact. So this is how the definitions have been worked it out on the impact side and the likelihood side. So one has to come up with a very clear understanding. Now, most of the companies, we have the registers. So we try to define the probability part, which is the likelihood part. We try to define the impact part. Then multiply the two, probability P, I is impact, I gives me the result. The date of assessment, mitigation action, delivery date. So this is the way. Now let me give you one case. Uh, let's say I'm trying to find the assessment of the risk around. Its nature, its scope, its timing. Then I'm next looking at risk exposure around. So risk exposure is nothing but P into C. Let's say the probability is there, 20%. The cost of the project, should the risk actually happen, if the cost of the project is $100,000 and the probability is 20%, the P into C becomes 20,000. Now, if I take another example of this one, P is 80%, 60 of 80 software components will have to be developed. C, total cost of developing is around this much. My RE is this much. So my risk, is, again, in, if I look at exposure is so much, if I can absorb this, fine. If I can't absorb, if you feel, if I go to another alternative and that costs me 20,000 more or 15,000 more, maybe that is a better alternative. So this is where you need to work it out as a part of risk management part. So this gives you beautifully to you the whole framework. On the x-axis, you have the impact. On the other side is the likelihood, the probability part. So you can see in this matrix, some in the extreme on the top corner, which are all high, high, high. Naturally, that's becoming a threat for you. You have to take action on that. Some which are on the lower end side, very low, and probability is also low, and the impact is low. With the yellow color, I think I can take it lightly. I know I have a choice is available to me. So then these risks I can prioritize also. I know my risks are there, but I can prioritize which is high, which one I should do first, which one is very important to me for my project, which one I can delay. So that's what we do. So in short, when I talk about the risk, the risk is nothing but the probability of occurrence and consequences. So that's how we define the risk in a mathematical way. Now, look at a bigger pictorial view of this one, risk management stepwise. First thing is to establish the contracts. I'm in a service industry. Some of them is an auto company, some is in a pharma company, somebody is in, I mean, I would say retail business, somebody is in finance. Each one has a different context. So I cannot copy the ideas from one to another. Each one has a different context. So depend, each one has an external and internal context. So each case you have a different story around. So you have to develop your own risk management context risk evaluation criteria. So risk evaluation criteria in an auto could be different, in a pharma could be different, in a, in a banking could be different. So each case could be different context. So my request to you would be, this is what you have to develop the context and the context must align with the corporate risk management philosophy. Because you are doing the risk management at the only supply management level. But then at the corporate level, the risk management, the business risk management, it has to align with that. Next come identify, as we said around, what can happen, when can happen, where it can happen, how it can happen. So those questions you have to ask around, then it helps you to identify, pinpoint the possible risk around. The next, analyze the risk. Now I say, guys, okay, the risk is of delivery with the supply. The risk is of price. The guy will quote something and later on will Blackmail me will increase the price at all. So those risks are the quality is going to be very poor. So those risks I try to analyze around. 
and estimate the level of risk now. Evaluate the risk. Now the next course comes, the risk is there. Now what do I do with the risk? So either I have to treat it. So you have to treat the risk around. How do I treat it? So that's different options around. That's what we were doing in few cases. Let's look at the evaluation risk. So evaluation part, you're comparing the level of risk with obviously risk criteria. Evaluation is prioritized as we discussed earlier, we prioritize those risks around. Now step is about deciding whether risks are acceptable or need treatment. The two choices you have. Do you want to accept it? Those which are in the yellow zone, you say, guys, I can accept it, not a big issue. But the one which are in the red zone, with a high probability and high, I would say, the impact around, they need treatment around. So that's what we will look at. So those which are coming here, they are challenged for you. So you cannot take an easy way this way. So those which are, which are coming and impacting you on the top segments, you have to take action. Are you to tell the management, guys, this is what could happen. So before you get into the trouble later on, because you are the chief, you are the CPO, you have to be very careful what to action. So where can my reduce the poverty? The only choice for you is, can I cut down the poverty for this? That's only possible if I have a choice. The example I was giving to you of the Philips caught the fire, then the companies Nokia and Ericsson, both are buying the chip from them. But the one guy is smart enough, they change the design, go to another supplier. Other guys still waiting, guys know the Philips will get settled down in the next three months, we'll buy from them. But your consequences are much bigger. Now come the risk acceptance. The very first part is okay, accept. Obviously, when I want to treat a risk, it costs me money. The example of Nokia and Ericsson, when I gave it to you, that means somebody has to spend money to redesign it. You spend money for tooling again, go down to a new supplier, it costs you extra fortune. So are you willing to spend money there? So there's a risk acceptance part. Again, the risk acceptance will depend on the ranking part. If your ranking say this is not high, it is a low impact around, so I will accept the risk around. Coming back to the treatment part. So the treatment mean I'm trying to look at the option for treating the risk that were not considered acceptable or tolerable. Now, what we say around when I say risk treatment is I'm trying to look at the options around. So are to reduce the likelihood of adverse occurrence. You can't mit totally mitigate zero. It has, you can mitigate it, but you can't make it zero. If you want to make it zero, maybe the cost is too high. So the options for you is avoid the risk. Find a new supplier. Change the likelihood of occurrence. If you feel this is bound to happen, the likelihood I can happen, that means I'm getting a design which is very special design, can I change the design itself, which is standard part? Let's say if India are using something which is based on inches system, nuts and bolts, while the country as a whole supplier makes a metric system, so why should not I change my design so that I can easily go down nuts and bolts from someone else? So let me change the likelihood of occurrence. So if I can make some change in the design around, change the material around, change some alternative material around, I can cut down the likelihood of occurrence. Change the consequences. If the consequences there, my production is going to stop, again, I may have to find some alternatives. Share the risk. And last is retain the risk. I mean, you have sufficient, you say, guys, don't worry, I can absorb it. Tips for the treatment, I would say around is, when implementing this, to plan things around, ensure that adequate resources are available to you. With all of us in procurement gets a fixed budget, depending on the plan. But if I'm going to spend double or triple on that, 
finance will not clear it and define a time frame, responsibility and method of monitoring this. Physically check that the treatment implemented reduces the residual risk around and go with order of priorities. You have resources, but go with the order of priorities to remedial the Myers to reduce the risk around. Now, next one comes, now in the whole chain, we have identified the risk. And after identifying, again, based on the context, we have checked the probability part, we check the impact part, and then probability and impact I've seen around, I've assessed around, where do I need to take actions? Then we looked around, guys, do I need to treat it? Now, after treating all those things around, still things may not go as you want to do that. You want to monitor and review. So monitor and review is an essential and integral step in the risk management process. You have to monitor it and check it whether whatever action you have taken, whatever decision you have taken, are they going in sync with your thoughts around that? If they're not going in sync with your corporate policy, that means you have to rethink of the process as a whole. The monitoring and review, risk needs to be monitored periodically, I would call to ensure the changing some do not change the priorities around. Very few risks remain static. So don't expect the risk what you thought two months back are same now. So you might have thinking of buying some oil, oil waste product around and then suddenly you find the oil prices have shot up in two months and your budget does not allow you. So your risk has gone. It's a financial impact. So therefore, the risk management always is never static. You have to be very careful. You have to look at it, particularly when you're dealing with volatile items, where every day, or sometimes you're changing with currencies, importing something, and your own country currency is not very stable. So those risks are also very particular. If you look at this bigger picture of risk control wise, the one on the top corner where the impact is high, the probability is high, you certainly need to review and rethink the strategy. In between, there are threats. In the corner, I can transfer the risk. The probability is very less. Impact is high, I'm not questioning, but the probability is very less. I can transfer the risk. The probability of an earthquake is very small, you can say, but the impact is very high. So I may think of some ways around. Let's say if I'm feeling poverty of floods and I'll have two plants, three plants, assuming, I'm not saying that's going to be the easy path, but if you're going to have two, three plants, okay, I can transfer my production from one to another. Tolerate, I can do because they're very low and very low probability as well. So this gives you a broad framework of managing it. So the matrix is again, it gives you very clearly the must manage on the lower side, if you look around, should accept the risk around, should monitor the risk around, should manage it gives you, this matrix gives you some direction of how to manage it as well. Now, why risk management? I think this one is, by now you must be very clear, the example I gave it to you of Hyundai and Nokia's, this is where I think it's very, very clear. The risk management is very important around I know some companies have even come with a business continuity plan as well, BCP. I hope all of you have the BCP, those who are big companies. I come from those organizations where BCP was must, must, must. And every three months I have to spend my reports around what action we are doing there. So better service delivery, more effective management, more efficient use of resources as well, reduced wastage, innovations, so when you are doing risk management, you also think of innovative ways. When you're not doing risk management, you're taking everything granted. Oh, here is the only one supplier. Here is the only design in the world with us. So that means you're not becoming innovative. When you know very well, guys, this design is so unique and creates trouble for me, you will think of some other alternatives. So you will try to become innovative. You will try to find new supply sources. Now, why do we need risk management? There are some quotes, I think, which are worth noticing it. The only alternative to risk management is crisis management. If you love crisis, you want to work on a firefighting mode all the time. I know most of the procurement and supply chain people, 
and most of the time under the risk part and crisis part. So to some extent, if you can think back, guys, why am I having this crisis? Why am I having this firefighting? Can I think back and manage my risk? And you know very well, any crisis management, when it happens later on, like the Hyundai case, they have to air shipment from Korea to this, cost you fortune, cost you more expensive, time consuming and embarrassing also. Similarly, when I look at those places where the government sector is involved around, without good this, government cannot manage its resources effectively. You must have seen many of the government projects get delayed, 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 delayed. Initial allocation might be 100 crore, and by the time it is made, it becomes 200 crores. So you have to think of those risk management of delay. Why the project should get delayed? The delay to me is a risk. And delay means cost. If you broadly look around the basics of risk management, I mean, you can see the risk is inherent. As I said to you, risk is all about uh, around us. So risk is inherent in every activity around. You do the bidding exercise, you place an order around, you sign a contract around. Even in the contract, what you signed, you might have missed out something. There's a risk. You got the goods received and somebody assigned received good, okay. Nobody opened the boxes around. And now you go for the claim. They say, oh, you mentioned, okay. How can you ask for the claim now? So risk is there all the time, inherent. Not to control that, I could put some resources Guys, this will not go until this is checked. So one has to look around the control point. So once the control is there, I'm able to, I mean, instead of two eyes, four eyes might be looking at it. So you could say that's a control parameter. Now control means I'm able to cut down my risk, but my still exposure is there. And then acceptance interaction. So after the exposure, Whatever is left around, is it acceptable to me the risk as well? So that's a broad summarized version if I want to say that. Now, so we have already covered this identification, assessment, control, monitoring. Now, coming back to the approaches we talked around, avoiding the risk, redesign the supply chain network. So your network, components, transportation. So keep in mind, supply chain has got four levers, you all know. One lever is procurement. Second is warehousing. Third is transportation. Fourth is my distribution general. So all these risks, all these, if I look at the levers, I have to redesign each one of them. Intelligent task shifting, addressing the incentive misalignment, intelligent community and codes based choice around, reducing the risk, then again, I've got a learning management information system, outsourcing, hedging the risk around. Hedging means I'm keeping extra buffer. That's a very simple thing. We don't need to study anywhere around. Risk means I keep extra stock. Okay, keep stock for six months. I remember the days when I used to work with Tata's in 17. I know some of the parts were coming from our headquarters from Carrier Corporation USA. So we know very well they'll come by C, three months, four month delay, custom clearance. We used to keep a stock of four to five months. Today you can't afford. So competitive world. So if I had to define it after going through all these slides around, it's a process of measuring and assessing risk and developing strategies to manage. So that's the way I would call it around. Now the management which we have, I would say still 70 to 80 percent companies in India, they are going with a conventional band. The risk part is still not built into their system. I work with many of the big companies in India here also. As a consultant, I can find the risk management is still not built into the process itself. Because they assume that everything will go well, but the day it goes wrong, then the crisis starts. So I would say one should contemplate all these abnormalities, what could happen, what could, and then take action on that. So we have to move from the conventional approach to risk management approach or management. 
BCP, I told to you, is very, very critical. So the business continuity plan involves around the practical plan, how your business can prepare for it. If something happens, the crisis happens, tsunami happens, how are you going to work? Earthquake happens, the flood happens. How do you ensure the continuity of plans? Because you know very well, if you're down for one month, two months, your competitor will take over your business. They'll take over the loyalty of your customers. So in short, you could lose a lot. Now, I'm taking this specifically from the procurement context. When I talk of procurement, the risk is all about supplier. Supplier is your partner. If you're not selected the right partners around, you're bound to have risk in this. So those people who are dealing specifically for procurement angle, you need to have a wonderful supplier selection process. Supplier capacity has to be seen, supplier strategy, has, sourcing strategy has to be there, types of product, manufacturing strategies, the geographical preferences, decision makers, decision criteria, minimum order quantities around, all these things you need to really work on before you go. There's another one we call the importance of vendors. Now here I want to again clarify, which I use very frequently, the word called vendor, the word called supplier. I mean, everybody is a potential supplier for you. But the moment they do business with you, they become vendor. So this is the terminology you can see comes from the implementation of ERP. All of you who are using ERP, you must be saying, you call vendor. The day it gets into the ERP system, you call them vendors. Till it is not, they are all suppliers. So suppliers can change quickly, impacting the entire supply chain. You've got a one supplier and there's another competitor of yours comes in. That guy is willing to pay them better. So all supplier changes around. Every day, so many suppliers are going bankrupt. So many suppliers are getting into the court judgment. So my point of telling here is we need to take care of what is happening to our data bank, supplier database. Are we really reviewing it on a regular basis? Are we updating it? That's what and data has to be updated as well. Now, the next thing come when we're talking of risk. To some extent, the risk is also associated with compliance. Because we are the one, we are holding the purse of the company. If you talk about the manufacturing, 60 to 70% of the sales revenue is spent by procurement team. You can imagine a big thing. We were talking about other companies, 25, 30% service industries. Manufacturing could be 60 to 70, could be even 80%. Now that means you have to be ensuring the compliance. Audit people want to see your actions. How did you make the requirements part? Were the requirements properly biased or not? Was it favoring any X supplier? The rules, are you following the rules? Product needs some standards. It has to match with ISO 9000, it has to match with ISO 14000. Are you complying with them? Governance part, who's governing this? The regulation part, I know very well, all of you have the regulations. I had the chance to build the regulation for even the manual for many of the companies and for country also someone. So regulation is very, very critical. The transparency part. How do you ensure transparency in your system? Which I feel is still lacking, lacking, lacking. If you look at the chain as a whole, you have a customer on one side, retailer, distributors, then you've got warehouses, you've got your manufacturing who makes in to out, and then you've got a procurement team around, and then you've got a supplier, and supplier, supplier, tier one, tier two, a whole chain, what is happening at the tier one, tier two supplier, you don't know. What is happening on the warehouse, the stock wise, you don't know. So the transparency is missing, because these whole line is very sequential type. And this is where the possibility when the blockchain come will help us to improve this. Policies, policies, and the next is the law part. Each one of you know when you make a contract at the bottom you write applicable law is this. But if you're an MNC, you have to spell it on which law is applicable. Your branch is everywhere in the part of the world. Are you going to follow the applicable law? Are you going to have some more arbitration clauses? So you need to understand the law part as well. 
You cannot say this is not my cup of tea. This is a legal people will do it. Sometimes you know better what potential risk can happen. Then you can tell the lawyer and then they can help you to draft the terms and condition better for you. Now compliance and supply management. So broadly, if I talk about compliance is nothing but all your operations is according to rules and regulations. That's what I'm trying to say. If I have to talk at the high level, you have the rules, you have the regulations, it must comply. Now, based on the rules and regulations, you make the procurement manuals, you make standard operating procedures, you make even various other process guidelines as well. Internal control framework is the first thing. Procurement guidelines, standard operating procedures. So my request to you would be, look back, do you have ICF or not? Do you have the procurement guidelines? Are you training your procurement staff when they join you on the first day, guys? These are my procurement guidelines. These are the ICF. Not that you're stopping the innovation, but the company has got some set guidelines. But if somebody has got better ideas, you can always change it. But at least it has to comply with that. So when we talk of internal control framework, the key elements of the control framework is you need a control environment. So that establishes the foundation part. The risk assessment, how it will be done in terms of identification, analysis, control activities around, information and communications, monitoring activities. So if I look around from based on this, you have your own procurement manual. You know very well control environment. Who can approve the purchase order? Who can sign the contract? Who can receive it? Same person can't receive and approve the purchase orders. So there's a demarcation of the task around. So you have control environments. You have a risk assessment as well. You have a control like risk assessment means somebody is writing at the end of the day, the chain, guys, the goods are bad, this is poor, quality was poor, delivery was like, so, and the risk is also being assessed in the whole chain as well. So you have policies, your procedures, your practices, and information as well you have to communicate around. And then at the end of the day, you have monitoring activity. You have a management audit around, you have internal audit around, and you also have external audit around. So they also monitor you, are you doing well or not? The types of control, if I talk around, we talk of before the fact. Before you sign anything, before you commit anything, there are controls. You all know very well. The budget has to be there. The plans has to be there. Business quantity issue has to be discussed. The forecast, if you're doing contract or making an agreement based on the forecast, particularly strategic sourcing, you need to have a right forecast around. Policy and procedure manuals. Then the next comes the during the fact. Now you have based on the fact, okay, guys, I've got the budget, I've got this. Now I'm going to start the process of committing myself. So when I'm doing this, it has to be a structured process. Who can build? Who can ask for RFQ? Who can evaluate the RFQ? Should I do RFP? When should I do RFP? So all the things around there. Adherence to policy and procedure. Specs. How do I write the specs around? Is it just one line? Is it a functional specs? Is it a performance specs? Does it give some quality requirement of the specs around? So if specs are not defining what is a function, what is the purpose, and what are the quality requirements around, and if I'm going for services, service level agreements are not spelled it out, or if I'm buying raw material like steel and cement, I have to say it should comply with industry standards. That has to be spelled. If it is not, certainly you're going to have a risk. After the fact control. So you have done the contracting part. Now you're receiving the goods, you're receiving the services. Then somebody making the reports for that. Somebody reviewing it. Audit is being done. The customer survey we're doing around. So you can imagine around this broadly cover holistically all type of control. And I know most of you have this. But are we training everybody around on this importance of this? So this is where I've tried to explain, so I don't need to repeat this thing. Internal control framework. Now this internal control framework comes basically relating to operation. We make standard operating procedures. 
whatever reportings are required every week, every month. I have to make a financial reporting, compliance with the laws and regulations. Operation parts, I would say in one line, standard operating procedure. You have to see if I'm dealing with hazardous site. So whenever I'm doing sourcing, I'm doing contract writing, I'm doing contract administration, these are all part of my operation. So those guidelines are there around, I have to comply with. If I don't do it, and if audit finds it out, I'm ahead of the supply management or supply chain or procurement, whatever you call, I have to answer those. I'm accountable for that. Then the next thing comes that procurement people spend so much money, you know, and they are the one who are records also are maximum there. So the records are hexagonal, then what do I do with internal records? Should I keep the copy of the acquisition? Should I keep the copy of the bids which came around? Should I keep the copy of the offers? Should I keep the copy of the evaluation, what was done? I'm not saying hard copy or digital, both are okay because the word is becoming digital, but do I need to keep the copy of that? So when I'm saying the record, it means I'm talking of paper. I know in some companies still paper is there. Electronic messages, which has gone. If tomorrow there's a dispute, those messages are required. Website content, document that decides on the PDAs, flash drives, desktops, and servers. Or any document management system, the software part, as well as company databases. So you need to have, this is what we are calling as record management. And each and every record need to be classified based on the importance of this, based on the severity of this around, it's very critical. I'm dealing with a very critical supplier, very high value contract around. And I know the supplier could ditch me up later. Then I need to classify. I want to keep very systematic. Financial controls, certainly. I might be showing a purchase order amount of this much. This payment is different. Receipt is different. So things are not matching. And some payment has been done without a purchase orders. Some companies very, very rigid. Without PO, no payments at all. Some cases, a maverick spend around. And those maverick spend, we can't control. Many companies have seen 25 to 30% in the maverick spend. So these are the financial control we need. Around. So you can say on the compliance side, we need a framework, broad framework. Under that, I need a control mechanism. I need the financial controls. I need the operational control. And the next one I would say is the legal and regulatory controls. If I'm dealing with chemical item, I'm creating fumes. That means I'm creating pollution. Is it acceptable? I have a power plant which is doing something. Agency laws and authorities are there around role of the legal counsel we have to see around. So what are the laws which are important to my business before I sign a contract? So one has to keep in mind this. Even for construction, I'm used to those in the US when we used to call code of construction as well. When the tomorrow the building or the highway fails, one has to say, guys, what is the code of construction to take care of this risk around? So in every activities around, you have a legal system, you have a regulatory controls to manage. Now each organization has a legal counsel, particularly those which are very big. They have a legal counsel who helps them to basically they help you to check the terms and conditions, applicable international domestic laws, standard and customized RFQ, RFP, which is orders. So that's a guy who helps you keeping in mind that today's requirement they helps you to improve, to mitigate your risk. Well, with this, I would like to again close on the quote by Charles Darwin. It is not the strongest and specific. You might be the biggest company. You might be the most intelligent company, but those who are willing to change, response to changes with what's happening in the environment and those who are creating a risk, if the risk becomes too big, your company, the big company can also go to door drop. So one has to respond to changes. If any risk is bound to happen, please take care of it. Well, with this, I want to thank you all for the patient hearing. I hope this was useful.